So what I want to talk to you about this morning is something that's so near to my heart in the season we're in, in the time we're in. Um, as we've been speaking to different people over the last couple of weeks and, and months, I realized the value of family and community. You know, when Jesus comes to the earth, and I, you've heard me make this joke so many times, he didn't come to be the Lone Ranger. Just remember, he, Jesus didn't need to take 12 disciples. He didn't need that. I mean, he's the Son of God. He goes around doing all the miracles. He didn't, like, rely on Peter to do the miracles. No, he actually, he did it himself. Jesus walked on the water. He didn't need them to walk on the water. Are you hearing? He invited them to walk with him. He went down to the shore and said, follow me. The Son of God, God himself, comes to the earth and does not sit at home alone. He doesn't stay in Nazareth. He goes to Bethlehem. He goes to, uh, to, to these different places. He goes to Jerusalem. He doesn't just keep to himself and does miracles in his town. No, he goes from town to town, from place to place. And eventually the 12 become 70 and then 120. And then we find 3,000. And then we find 12,000. And then we find the whole world. But he starts off by inviting people to follow him. God himself wants community. And you find that what we go through, um, what we've been through, is that the enemy has come to a place where it's put people into homes and pushed people away from community and especially from touch and feel and see. When Scripture itself say, lay hands on the sick. Well, now? Now you can't even get close to the sick. You've got to throw your food to them like, catch! <laughs> Leave the plate outside and then run away and then stand 300 kilometers away from the person. Come on. In a world where it's moved away from affection, it's moved away from human touch. And we find that when you look at the studies they've done with children, and maybe you've watched a lot of these videos or anything, I don't want to go into much detail with this, but as an intro to this morning is that children who do not, little babies who do not get that first touch and feeling and, and nurturing where after birth and in the, be the beginning stages, they struggle with a lot of things within their life. I'm not going to go into all the detail of that, but because touch is so important. That first touch, that connection, that feeling, that being there. Um, I love some of these, uh, these uh, videos that are going out right TikTok or Instagram or Reels that on social media where parents do certain things with their children, like the one little kid was watching a video and mom comes and lies with her head on top of the little girl's lap, and you see the girl starts touching her mom, and eventually she forgets about what's happening on the telly, and she actually starts kissing her mom and, and connecting with her mom, because she invaded that space and love and affection. Okay. Babies don't happen via distance. <laughs> There's only one that happened that way. That's Mary. <laughs> Holy Spirit came over and Jesus was born, but everything else doesn't work that way. Sure, it's very quiet on that topic. Shouldn't be talking about that in church. <laughs> but you hear what I'm talking about? The context of what that is is community, is touch. And I start looking at people that are single parents and how they struggle to have to take care because we live in a society where a lot of that is happening, a lot is there, is that how do boys get male figures in their life if they're... <laughs> Enough stuttering, done. Let's continue. Um... If, if fathers are absent, how do they get that? How do they find two parents? Because only one can fulfill all the roles. And how do they bring up children? And I started reading a book many years ago about tribes. And I love the uh, steward and them in Johannesburg is called the Tribe Church because they believe that they're a tribe and they do life together. When you start looking at doing life together, then as a single mom or a single dad or, or even just parents struggling to find like, hey, we don't know how to do this because our parents have passed on or we don't have family and we live in a certain town. How do we bring up our children if we don't have community? Because a tribe can help bring up a child and bring in influence and bring that children to an understanding of who God is, how does influence work, what is parenting, what are father figures. 
in the society we live in. A friend of mine who is in the United States who have a living in a, in a um, very liberal area of the United States have a couple that have come to him, a um, gay couple with two women, and they adopted a little boy, and they've come to the pastor and said, would you be a father figure to our son? And I'm going, what an opportunity to have influence into a society when we don't look as judgment to the church, but love and saying, man, we want every opportunity to influence the next generation. What are we doing with that? How do we live that? Do we have space for people that when the youth, and this morning in the first service, we, we didn't do that. His body's going to do it in the second service. And I can tell you what he's going to He's going to be rapping in the second service as part of the worship. And you're like, but that's not my style. Oh, that, well, that one fell flat, huh? And I was like, I, I don't like that. So I, I like the church organ. Or I like that. If we don't make space amongst us where we celebrate that, where we go like, man, I might not like that style of music. I might not like that way of how you dress or the way you are, but I give space for it as a community, as a tribe. Then when those children can find that space and comfort in the church, they're not going to find it anywhere else. They're not going to look for it anywhere else because I'm getting celebrated right here. You know, the biggest audience that you're singing or performing for or acting in front of is the church. Why would you want to go to a club? If you've got two, three hundred people going, yeah, that's amazing. And you go to a club and there's ten people going, oh, that's amazing. You don't want to go to the club anymore because that's boring. I'd rather go to the church. Because at the church, they celebrate me. At the church, they love me. At the church, I can pick up a flag if I want to. At the church, I can dance. At the church, I can do what I can act. I can be because I find that as a place. Of, so here's the context is God's got a body. It's not, God's, not, the head's not decapitated in, in heaven and he has this body on earth trying to find its way. No, Jesus is the head of the body. And the body has different functions, and you part of that body, that's why you can't sit at home or just be separated to what God's doing in a community. God's called you to be part of something. God's called you to follow. And as Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Follow me as I follow Christ. Why? Because in that context of what that is, you've got something the way you see God that I haven't seen yet. I know I've shared this story before, but I want to share it again. Is a friend of mine that had passed on already, but she used to tell the story with such fondness, is that her gran, who lived out in Nisena, uh, passed away, and so the entire family were there, and everybody's sitting around the table, and she got up, and she said, okay, I know I was gran's favorite, so, and everybody like, huh? No ways, you were not, I was. And she said, no, but gran did this, 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 and said, well, but gran did the same to me, this, this, this. And when they started talking about this, they realized that she made everyone feel like they were her favorite. But when they started talking about it, they started seeing a side of grandma that they did not know through the eyes of another sibling, of a cousin, of a brother or a sister. I want to tell you, I cannot follow Christ without you. Because the way you see him, the way you experience him is different to me. And I can learn through that. I can see that and experience God through your eyes, through your experiences, through what God's done for you, through what you've lived. For those who've walked longer than me, right? Because you're experiencing God in a certain way, whether that's good or bad in your life. But when we live together, when we start walking together, when we follow together, and when we realize God's put us here for a reason as part of a body, then we know we can walk this well together. Is it making sense? Because the world doesn't want to do things together. Dave preached on this last week. The, the church wants to fight amongst each other. Who wants the vaccine? Who doesn't want the vaccine? This is going to happen. That's going to happen. I spent two hours yesterday on a call to a pastor and leader in New Zealand who right now New Zealand is in an eight-week lockdown. They've been put back into their homes, and it's crazy. People are getting so frustrated and angry, and because why? They are again being separated for only a few cases. 
And so they're frustrated because where is going? And his anger is, but the, va- the vaccine and not the vaccine. And I will not do this. And, I, and I'm going, brother, come on. You've got to get back to Jesus. Don't, don't lose focus on who Jesus is and what God's doing in this. And we're speaking to and inspiring each other. Don't look at what those things says. We've got to follow a certain way. And how does it work? Community. How do we, and what's the enemy doing? Taking us away from community. He's dividing us. He's dividing us on certain issues. He's dividing within certain contexts. Like, I'm going to fight about this, or I'm not going to fight about that, or I'm going to take it. I'm not going to take it. And if you take it, I look down on you. I've had some people with some, the grace police. Who's ever met those people? They, they, or the, the spiritual police. They're always better than you. You go like, yo, I've been str- struggling. We just put up this alarm system. What? You got an alarm system? I walk by faith, not by sight. I don't have an alarm system. I sleep with my doors open. And then what do you feel like? Oh, Jesus, I'm so weak. Is that, walk away from your car. You lock your car. You lock your car? Don't you have faith? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> Come on, have you met those kind of people? They always make you feel like you're not a good enough Christian. That's not community. That's Pharisees. If, you don't, if your faith is that strong that you can leave your cars and your doors and your everything open and, and have pack a hamburger outside when the criminals come, you feed them too. Like you have that kind of faith and I don't, that's okay. Because I'm walking a road with Jesus. And we can help each other and inspire each other and not look down on each other because I'm maybe not there where you're at. And we create that kind of atmosphere. We're going to see people set free. We're going to see people grow. We're going to see people's lives are changed. Because here's the thing. He did not call us for this natural world. He called us to be an influence in this natural world. Let's go quickly to 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, we know the, the scriptures I can quote is, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And uh, beautiful scripture is when Jesus is in the earth and he's uh, confronted with the enemy. What does the devil say to him? It's like, eat this or turn these stones to bread. He says, man shall not live, but by every that proceeded out of the mouth of. Oh, wow. So my sustenance, my life sustenance, my very influence in my life is not from the natural. It's from the Spirit. But we've been living from the natural. We've been relying on it. We've been building our faith on it. We've been building our foundation on it. And when it's shaken, we're shaken because it's not Jesus. He says, build your house on the rock. Build your house on Jesus. Build your house in the faith. Build your house in the Spirit, not in the natural. And I do believe that a lot of what we've been preaching about prosperity is good. I do believe in prosperity. But a lot of the church have become focused on being rich instead of being faithful. Being rich instead of being obedient. Being rich instead of maturing. So when I don't get rich or it doesn't happen, I'm not thankful. So my benchmark is where I am financially instead of just being thankful. Man, I, I know that in my lifetime <laughs> or in life so far, we haven't had the greatest run as Bassons financially. Meaning uh, my, dad didn't, my dad doesn't drive a Range Rover. Oh, it's very quiet on that. I, 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 can we put I don't drive a Range Rover. Meaning I, like, I, I looked at it. I don't... I don't go on Christmas and go buy my dad a nice Rolex and give him a nice Rolex. I mean, that would be nice. That would be great. But I haven't, I haven't had that. I've been through some tough ups and downs financially. And, and I don't want to go into my testimony, but it's not been that. It's been very, very tough. I was sharing with somebody yesterday like, how many times I've had to share my bedroom, how we've had to share our home how we sh- as children growing up because we bring in other families who don't have or we, we don't have and we're living with our grandparents. And it's just such tough times. But I look back on my life and I go, wow, I've had some incredible experiences with God. 
I've been able to travel the world. I've been able to travel the world with my parents. I've been able to see God do phenomenal things. We've got, we're sitting here on, in the week, and we've got 20 pastors sitting here together that's traveling and, and ministering and, and following us as we grow together. And I'm looking at all of this. I might not have been able to buy a Rolex to my dad, but, man, I've seen God do phenomenal things. Thankfulness going like, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that I have a car. Right now, my car is leaking through the roof, so, but I'm, at least I'm thankful I have a car. Because the rust is so bad that it's dripping on me as it's raining. So, I just, come on, let me just be honest with you a little bit here. And I, like, I got in the car and I was like, Lord, why aren't you taking care of me? Oh, have you had those moments? And then I heard a soft voice saying, because it's soft and gentle, and the Holy Spirit is a little sarcastic, going, you could have walked. And I'm going, Lord Jesus, thank you for my car, man. Because walking outside, is, this car is still better than walking outside. Oh, come on. I want, I want to see. Some of you are looking at that rusty old car of yours or that thing, and you go like, but ah, I don't see that Mercedes Benz. I look at that pastor who's flying first class, or I'm doing that, and I go like, wow, why, why am I not there? You, you're not living in the Spirit right now. You're comparing and gratefulness and thankfulness is such a powerful thing. Lord, I thank you that I'm at least here, that I'm alive, that I woke up this morning. Is it making sense? Okay, let's read you quickly. First Corinthians chapter 2. Okay, let's give one shout to that. First Corinthians chapter 2. Good, okay. That's a good start. Not every time, right? Okay, good. <laughs> uh, verse, let's read verse 5. Uh, okay, can we jump to four? Let's maybe jump with four. Let's start there. And my speech and my preaching were not of persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, uh, but in the power of God. However, we speak a wisdom amongst those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of the age, for they are coming to nothing. What does he say? He says, we're, we're not involved with the wisdom of men. We're not going for what the rulers of this age are, whether it's the spiritual or not spiritual. I'm not getting in like, oh, did you guys feel there is this spiritual oppression over strand, and, and we've got to fight that. Now, this is a sensitive topic now, because some of you might be in that kind of thing, and I, and I just want to go like, I'm not there, because I'm seated in heavenly places. So yes, there might be something that wants to manifest, but, but come on, here's what this friend told me yesterday. So if you've got somebody that uh, is illegally in your home, uh, or you've got a property that you're owning, and somebody's illegal, you get an eviction notice. And then you go down there and you go like, oh, you got to move now. That person doesn't have authority or power. All they're doing is they're occupying. So they're occupying, but you have the authority. So you come with authority and you say, now you've got to move out of my place. They don't have authority. They're only occupying. The devil doesn't have authority. He only occupies. We don't even give him authority. We just allow him to occupy some spaces that we have not taken up in. So because we're not ruling and reigning, he's occupying a certain space in Strand. He's occupying a certain space in your life because you haven't taken up your authority. Over. He doesn't have authority. He's just occupying. But the moment I understand my authority, I can step in and say, Satan, move. Out. But don't go like, oh, Satan, if you feel like it. Uh, can I make you a suggestion? Will you move on Monday? If, that, if it doesn't suit you, move on Tuesday. No, no, come in like, excuse me. You are occupying my space. Move. Move out of my life. Move out of the situation. You are occupying my space. But it comes from an understanding of knowing what authority you have. What's that authority in your life? Not what authority he has. He has no authority because all authority has been given to Jesus. 
And he, in his authority, he says, now walk. So walking in that option, no, move. But he says there, don't rely on the wisdom of man. Don't get caught up with what those things are. Where are you seated? In heavenly places. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds. So there's something about the word that applied to my life brings life, brings freedom, brings breakthrough, that brings revelation, brings understanding. When I start living from that place, things start shifting. Can we go quickly to Timothy, back to Timothy there, and I'll finish with this. I hope it's helping you a little bit. Okay, so Second Timothy, where we read earlier, chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Hold fast to the patterns of sound words which you have heard, from men in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. What do, you, what do you need to do? Hold fast to the patterns of sound words. Hold fast. Uh, a while ago, I went with some friends out sailing. Who's ever sailed? Anybody's ever sailed? Um, so we decided it's, it's on the west coast and uh, the wind was pumping. And so we're on this boat, and when you're in the harbor, it, it, you kind of feel what the wind is. And then suddenly, you're out into the open ocean. And so the, the sail was dropping almost, the entire boat was like this. I was sitting, and so as we go out, we didn't realize it was going to be that rough. And so the captain shouts, uh, just get the pump out of the dinghy at the back. <laughs> and I'm like... Oh, well, nobody's responding. It's probably then he's talking to me. <laughs> and so the stinky's hanging on the back. The boat's skewed. We're sailing at a massive speed. Knots. Okay, I've got to get the right words here. And so I'm hanging off the back while this dinghy is, and it's water squashing. And and I'm like, Jesus, am I going to see you today? <laughs> this feels pretty rough. They don't look scared. I'm feeling really scared right now. So I'm not waiting for the boat to, so as the dinghy comes up, I've got to grab it as it comes. It's not just hanging over. And as this dinghy comes up, I grab this pump, pull a pump in, and then he shouts. Now things are all over the show. The crates are everywhere. It seems like we weren't prepared for this moment. <laughs> And then he like, tie the crates. So we tie. Now I'm sitting on this thing, looking at the water down here. I'm standing. Literally, this boat is like this, flying, and tying up everything. And we get it. And as we go, I look ahead and I see there's some buoys up front here. And uh, <laughs> I tell the guy, "Listen, is is that? What is that?" <laughs> and he goes, "It's a fish farm. Grab the ropes." So we're on our way into this fish farm, and this boat is flying, and we're gr and he just I've never sailed, man. Yes, they just pull that what rope? What where? What am I like? What this is crazy? And and he's still calm, but I'm realizing, yeah, I want to see Jesus now. This is we need to get this thing. I grab that rope, man. We're wrapping that thing and we're pulling because we got to get the sail turned so we can turn. Hold fast. I didn't go to that little rope, and then we all started pulling a little bit. We're on our way for destruction. We're going to sink out here, and the wind is pumping, and the ocean is crazy. We're going to hold fast and pull some ropes. It's not just like, okay, trackum suhe ne tubiki. No. No, we've got to hold that rope. We've got to pull that thing in and bring it tight. And, we, and the boat starts turning. And then when the boat finished turning, we like I'm freaked out. Like I'm saying the adrenaline is pumping, and now the fear is gone, and now it's just adrenaline, and now I'm going, Whoa, this is amazing. And like the boat's bouncing, this sailboat in the wind, and uh, one of the other ladies run to the front, they're holding on in the front. So we were just about to die. Okay, probably not that bad, but now we're having fun. Now we're freaking out and we're screaming and we're going wild. But just a moment ago, I had to hold fast. How much of what we're doing is holding fast to the patterns of doctrine and word in our life? We're doing it the same way as 
what we would do on our way in the natural, going towards a fish farm and like pulling that thing and grabbing hold of that rope. And like, I know I've got to change the direction of this boat because otherwise I was going to, but you've got to change the direction of your life or you're holding fast to the word. You've got to change the direction of the city or we're holding fast to the word. We've got to change the direction of our nation or we're holding fast to the word. Am I, I've got to change the directions of my children. Am I holding fast to the word? Is that the thing that brings life or am I just holding to what I'm trying to do in the natural? God's giving you a word and what you're doing is you're trying to fulfill that word in the natural. When he says, hold fast to the patterns of the word that I've given you. Stay there. He goes on, for lack of time, I'm not going to go there, but he goes on to tell Timothy and he says, man, do you remember when they laid hands on you? Do you remember what God gave you? Go. Be. And I want to stir that this morning in your heart. Would you stand with me as we, we finish this morning? Some of you need to hold fast to some word. Some of you need to grab hold of that word and, and pull it into life. Some of you need to get some help around you, like me in the gym, and get to that place where you're asking some community, like, man, I, I need to grow on these things in my life, and I'm not getting it all together. I'm not seeing it all there. I need you to pray with me. I need you to journey with me because follow me as I follow Christ, man. I, let's, let's walk this road. And we're going to see things change because we're not trying to do it naturally. There's a shift happening in the world, in the church. There's a seriousness coming back in a, into the church for prayer and fasting and seeking God, knowing the Word of God and seeing God's power show up. And you call to be part of that. But there's some word in your life that this morning I felt, and that's why I wanted to end there. You gotta hold fast to the word. God's given you word over your family, God's given you word over your future. And if you haven't got a word, then it's time to find somebody and say, Pray with me, I need a word for my life. Come to me and come to one of the leaders, come and say, Look, listen, man, I I don't know what God's word is for the rest of my life. Maybe you're in retirement or you're in a new phase. What is God saying to me now so that I can follow that word and hold fast to it for me, for my wife, for my husband, for my children? What is God saying? Let's pray, Father. Oh, there's such a beautiful atmosphere here. I know you're taking people to new places. You're growing us, maturing us, Lord. You're showing us new things. We say yes. We say yes to every bit of that, Lord. I pray right now that each one here in this place would May this word drop in their heart. I thank you for it, Lord, today. Those who are sick, I thank you for healing. Lord, I thank you that you're giving them words of healing to declare over their life. Those who are in debt and despair and depressed, thank you that you give them word to hold fast to to declare over their life. For we shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of your mouth, Lord. I thank you for it, Lord, today. I bless everyone in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, let's give God praise this morning.